Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the ACR ultrasound LIRADS for screening and surveillance in HCC. Let's see, get my mouse here. Okay. Oops. Okay, so these are my disclosures. I just want to disclose that I am the chair of the ultrasound LIRADS working group. I'm a member of the version 2017 LIRADS writing group and a member of the LIRADS steering committee. So I have a personal vested interest in all of you adopting LIRADS and especially ultrasound LIRADS. <laughs> and CEUS, yes, a plug for CEUS too, it's very important. Okay, so a lot of you probably use LIRADS already, um, but perhaps you have not heard of ultrasound LIRADS. It's actually brand new. We just released it in August of 2017 on the ACR website. So ultrasound LIRADS stands for Ultrasound Liver Imaging Reporting and Data System. And we provide a standardized system for screening and surveillance ultrasounds in patients who are at risk. That's really important. These are at risk patients only. Uh, for developing HCC. So it's kind of interesting, all major societies actually do recommend using ultrasound for screening and surveillance, <clears throat> um, but none of them go into detail about how to perform the examination, how to interpret the examination, or how to report the ultrasounds. So there's a huge void in the existing literature, and so ultrasound LIRADS helps to fill in this void. And hopefully, by having this system, we can then help with data collection, which can then perhaps influence future directions in HCC screening and surveillance. So LIRADS as a whole has four major components. There's the ultrasound LIRADS, which is for screening and surveillance. In HCC, it's different, separate from contrast-enhanced ultrasound, which is Stephanie's <laughs> baby. Um, there's CTMR LIRADS, which most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, the most recent iteration came out in July of 2017, and they also included a treatment response algorithm within that um, iteration. So I'm really fortunate to be working with a large group of very talented individuals who are all experts in ultrasound. Uh, most people also do CT and MR in their practice, so it really helps to put ultrasound in perspective uh, in the greater scheme of HCC imaging. Okay, so I'm going to first talk about screening and surveillance um, in general, and then I will talk about ultrasound, the ultrasound LIRADS algorithm. So as you know, HCC is a cancer of the hepatocyte. It's the sixth most common cause of cancer, but the second most common cause of cancer death in the world. So it's quite lethal. Um, but it only occurs in the setting of chronic liver disease, most commonly cirrhosis, in 80 to 90 percent of patients. So when you have a disease that is so prevalent and lethal, it's really important to do screening and surveillance to improve survival. And the goal of screening and surveillance in HCC is to be able to detect preclinical HCC when patients are not symptomatic, uh, to identify HCCs when they're potentially curable, either with local therapy or with transplantation. And the ideal interval has been shown to be every six months, semi-annual surveillance. And I will talk about that in a little bit more detail, and this may also be a Sam's question. <laughs> okay, so I talk about screening and surveillance, but there's actually a difference. So screening is where you apply a diagnostic test to a population that is at risk for developing a disease. And so the first time you apply that test, you are detecting the prevalence of the disease, so that's screening. Every subsequent time that you apply that same diagnostic test to the same at-risk population at a defined interval for that particular disease, that is now surveillance. And now you're going to be detecting the incidence of the disease. So with HCC, there are actually two major tests out there for screening and surveillance. There's ultrasound and there's AFP. So ultrasound is actually recommended by all international societies with the um, surveillance interval of six months being the most common. 
Um, it has the advantage of, of being widespread in its availability. It's non-invasive, as you all know. It's accepted, well accepted by patients and physicians. Um, there's moderate cost associated with ultrasound. It's a lot cheaper than, for instance, CT or MRI, so it is cost effective as a screening and surveillance test. Sensitivity, on the hand, other hand, is somewhat variable depending on what you read in the literature, somewhere between 60 to 89 percent. And this variability in sensitivity is something that we actually do address with our ultrasound LIRADs. Um, specificity, on the other hand, with ultrasound is actually very high, 90 percent in the literature, when you use it as a screening surveillance test. AFP, on the other hand, is only advocated by Asian societies, and they use a threshold of 200 nanograms per milliliter, which actually only has a sensitivity of 22 percent. If you lower your threshold to 20 nanograms per milliliter, per milliliter, then the sensitivity increases to 60 percent, but then you have a lot of false negative or false positives. And so because of this variable performance, the AASLD does not currently advocate AFP, although it is being revisited. So what is the evidence for using ultrasound? Well, actually, there isn't that much evidence out there. There's actually been only one large randomized controlled study that was performed in China where they had almost 19,000 patients with chronic hep B with and without cirrhosis. And in this study, they actually had two groups, those pa patients who underwent screening and surveillance with ultrasound and AFP every six months and those who didn't. And in the patients who had screening and surveillance, even though they had a pretty poor compliance rate of about 60 percent, they were still able to show a 37 percent reduction in HCC-related mortality. There was another randomized controlled study where they only used AFP, and that did not change mortality. So we think that the first study, uh, we can attribute that decrease in mortality to ultrasound. Uh, there was another mass screening study published out of Taiwan where they used ultrasound one time and they were able to show a mortality decrease of 31 percent. We don't think that there's going to be another large randomized controlled study to be replicated like these because of the ethical consequences of not doing screening and surveillance. Okay, so when you do screening and surveillance, it's important to identify your surveillance population. Um, the AASLD is, uh, currently defines the surveillance population in the United States to include cirrhotic patients from any etiology. Uh, for those patients, the incidence of HCC exceeds 1.5 percent per year, so that is considered to be cost effective. And they also include non-cirrhotic chronic hep B patients in whom the incidence of HCC exceeds 0.2 percent per year. So it's not all chronic hep B patients. It's only certain subsets that exceed this threshold, and that includes Asian males over 40, Asian women over 50, African and North American blacks of any age, and patients who have a family history of HCC and have chronic hep B. So there are other patients who are, um, have an increased risk of HCC but their risk does not exceed these defined thresholds. And so in those patients, the benefit of surveillance is actually uncertain. And so the AASLD does not officially advocate surveillance in those patients, um, but it depends on your local regional preferences. So your institution may choose to do screening and surveillance in these patients below, non cirrhotic chronic hep C patients with stage three fibrosis, non cirrhotic hep B patients that don't meet these criteria, non cirrhotic NAFLD patients or transplant candidates who don't meet those criteria, but they're not currently advocated for by the AASLD. That said, it actually depends on where you live. So LIRADS is North America. So we align ourselves with the AASLD for our screening and surveillance population. But it's actually different if you live in Japan. The Asian Pacific Association for the Study of Liver Disease has a slightly different population. The Korean Society and the European Society, they all have slightly different populations. I just want to point out that child PUC cirrhotics are not currently advocated for screening and surveillance. And the reason for that is that their life expectancy is not long enough 
to warrant screening and surveillance, unless they are waiting a liver transplant. Okay, so I talked about the surveillance interval, and um, the surveillance interval actually depends on the growth rate of the tumor, not the risk of HCC development. And so all major societies do recommend every six month uh, imaging. Um, and the, the evidence out there is that there's two studies that have shown that six months is better or improves survival compared to 12 months. There's one study that's a little bit older that looked at six versus 12 months and showed that they were equivalent. That was from 2002. And then there are a couple of other studies that used shorter interval surveillances, less than six months, and didn't show any benefit to survival. So six months seems to be the sweet spot for HCC. Okay, so that's screening and surveillance. Let's get to the meat of this, the ultrasound LIRADS algorithm. Okay, so in our algorithm, we do talk about how to do the ultrasound examination. It's really important that you use proper technique. This is probably all obvious to you guys, um, but you do want to optimize by making sure that the patient hasn't eaten at least four to six hours prior to the ultrasound. Uh, to minimize bowel gas, you wanna optimize the image to adequately penetrate the whole liver, looking um, so that you can see the entire liver and diaphragm get transverse and longitudinal views through the liver. You're really looking specifically for any focal abnormality or diffuse parenchymal abnormalities, uh, which we'll talk about. We do recommend that when you look at the main portal vein, that you look at it with both grayscale as well as color Doppler, not just color Doppler, because the blooming artifact from color Doppler could potentially obscure a subtle non-occlusive thrombus, which you might be able to see with grayscale better. We leave it optional whether you get color Doppler views of the branches of the portal vein, right and left branches, right, middle, and left hepatic veins. Some institutions do that like Stanford, but others do not, so that's optional. Unless you see a vein thrombus, then we do recommend that you look at that more carefully with color or spectral Doppler. Okay, so this is kind of a busy slide, but these are just all the different recommended ultrasound views in longitudinal and transverse. This is available online. Again, optional views include the color and spectral tracings of the veins. And then cine loops we leave as optional, although we have found anecdotally that cine loops helps to improve your sensitivity. So the way this all fits together is that a patient should undergo screening or surveillance every six months with ultrasound. If the ultrasound is positive, ultrasound three, then they should go on to further characterization with a contrast-enhanced multiphasic CT, MR, or contrast-enhanced ultrasound. So the goal of the ultrasound, the surveillance ultrasound, is to detect a lesion or detect an abnormality. The goal of the diagnostic study is to characterize the, the lesion. Okay, so ultrasound LIRADS, in a nutshell, you should provide two scores. Okay, the first score is the ultrasound category, and that determines the follow-up, and there are three possible, ca three, three parts to this, or three possible categories, ultrasound one negative, ultrasound two subthreshold, and ultrasound three positive. We'll talk about each of these in more detail. And then we recommend that you provide a visualization score. So the visualization score addresses that sensitivity we talked about. The visualization score, you can have visualization A, no or minimal limitations, visualization B, moderate limitations, or visualization C, severe limitations. And this communicates the expected level of sensitivity of the ultrasound in a particular individual, but does not determine follow-up. Okay, looking at the ultrasound category first, we've color-coded it, just like the rest of LIRAD, so ultrasound one, negative, it's green, that's good. You can continue on with your surveillance every six months. Ultrasound two, subthreshold is yellow. It means caution. And so we would recommend short interval surveillance, three to six months. And then ultrasound three, positive, stop. It's red. Go on to further characterization with, with CT, MR, or CEUS. And notice that these are numbers as opposed to visualization scores, which are letters A, B, or C. Ultrasound category, one, two, three. Okay, so these are the different management um, follow-ups. So ultrasound one, negative, six-month routine surveillance. Ultrasound two, sub-threshold, 
um, short interval ultrasound in three to six months, and then ultrasound three positive for their characterization with a multiphasic study. So in a little bit more de detail, <clears throat> ultrasound one negative. This means that there is no evidence of HCC. So either you see nothing or, some, or you see something, but it is definitely benign. And by that we mean a simple cyst, focal fat spearing, uh, most commonly around the gallbladder, a previously confirmed benign lesion, such as a hemangioma or FNH, for instance, or calcification. So those would all be considered ultrasound one negative studies. And here's an example of a patient who has a normal liver except for a cyst. Ultrasound two subthreshold is where you have an observation that may warrant short-term ultrasound surveillance. And by that, we actually mean that we see something observation that measures less than 10 millimeters in longest dimension that's not definitely benign, and it can be of any echogenicity. So here's an example. Here we see a hyperechoic subcentimeter lesion. We would say that this is ultrasound 2 subthreshold. We see these very frequently in patients who have chronic liver disease, and so we don't really want to be chasing all of these, every single one of these. Many of them do not have CT <clears throat> or MR correlates, and so these would warrant a short interval follow-up. Another patient with a subcentimeter hyperechoic lesion, again, short interval follow-up. The reason for that is that although many patients have these with chronic liver disease, we don't want to miss a subtle early HCC. This patient actually got lost to follow-up, and one year later, uh, he came back, and this lesion had grown substantially into this large arterially enhancing lesion with washout. So this is what you do not want to happen. You want to detect that lesion early. <coughs> Another example of a hypoechoic subcentimeter subthreshold uh, lesion. Ultrasound 3 positive is where you see an observation that warrants further characterization. Um, I'm trying to use the word observation instead of lesion because observation does not convey an opinion, whether positive or negative or suspicious or non-suspicious. Observation is more neutral. Um, so we do try to use observation in LIRADS. In any case, an ultrasound three positive would be either an, a focal observation that measures greater than or equal to 10 millimeters in longest dimension or a new thrombus in a vein. <clears throat> Oops, let me go back. Um, and I just wanna also mention that we include in this parenchymal distortion um, as part of an ultrasound three positive. I'll show you some examples of that. Okay, so ultrasound three positive. Here's an example, isoechoic observation measures over 10 millimeters. That should be characterized further with a multiphasic study. Another example of an ultrasound three positive uh, observation, quite a bit larger, that should also be characterized. Another patient with a slightly hyperechoic observation, increased through transmission. There's some detectable internal vascularity here. How many of you would say this is suspicious for an HCC in a patient who is at risk? Okay, well this is a trick question. You're not characterizing this on ultrasound. Ultrasound in this case is used to detect a lesion or detect an observation. Um, this should be characterized definitively on a multiphasic study in this case. We see that it's hyper-enhancing on arterial phase, washes out on portal venous and delayed phase. It measures over two centimeters in size. And so by that, by LIRADS, this meets LIRADS-5 criteria, definite HCC. But that determination needs to be made with a contrast study. Another example, hypoechoic observation over one centimeter. Again, we're not trying to characterize this, we're detecting it. In this case, this has rim enhancement or targetoid enhancement that persists on arterial, portal venous, and delayed phase. It's retaining contrast, and so this is actually quite characteristic of a cholangiocarcinoma. Parenchymal distortion, in my opinion, is a lot more challenging to identify, but if you're looking for it, you will see this. So with parenchymal distortion, we define that as an area, ill-defined area of heterogeneity, refractive edge shadows, or an area where you've lost your normal hepatic architecture. And here's an example, it's quite subtle, but we've lost our normal hepatic architecture here. And there's a little bit of mass effect on the portahepatus. 
These areas of parenchymal distortion very frequently correspond to infiltrative HCC, so you don't want to miss those. Another example, in this patient, they have parenchymal distortion uh, manifest by uh, refractive edge shadows throughout the liver in an area where we've lost our normal portal triads, and that corresponds to this large infiltrative HCC. If you see a thrombus in a vein, um, you want to look at that more carefully with color Doppler. In this case, with color Doppler, we see there's a lot of internal vascularity and detectable arterialized flow. So this is quite characteristic on ultrasound as a tumor in vein. Um, <clears throat> I just want to let you know that LIRADS no longer uses tumor thrombus. It's tumor in vein. That's the correct term, tumor in vein. So sometimes you can actually see tumor in vein quite characteristically on ultrasound, but not always. And so that's why we don't actually require that you try to characterize it on grayscale ultrasound. This is a different patient with really marked parenchymal distortion in the liver. That alone would um, classify this as an ultrasound 3 positive study, but in this case they also have a thrombus in the portal vein. It turned out to be a tumor in vein, but really hard to tell in this color Doppler ultrasound. Okay, so those are the ultrasound categories, which were red, yellow, and green. Now we're going to talk about the ultrasound visualization score. So the visualization score communicates the expected level of sensitivity in an individual patient. So you see now we are in grayscale. We don't have colors anymore, and we're using letters A, B, or C. A, no or minimal limitations, B, moderate limitations, and C, severe limitations. And so the way uh, we think about this is it's very analogous to mammography, where in mammography you are describing breast density, and that breast density, if it's a very dense breast, that just conveys the expected level of sensitivity of that mammogram in that patient, but it doesn't necessarily change management. So very similarly, the ultrasound visualization score conveys the expected level of sensitivity of that ultrasound, but it does not change management. Okay, so visualization A, no or minimal limitations. This is where you think if you have any limitations, they are really unlikely to meaningfully affect sensitivity. So here's a normal looking liver. Different patient with a visualization A, no or minimal limitations. Some mild cirrhosis here, nodularity. Once you get to visualization B, we call this moderate limitations, where you think that there are some limitations that may potentially obscure small masses. By that, we mean less than a centimeter in size, whether the liver is moderately heterogeneous, as we see here, or there may be moderate beam attenuation that may obscure some parts of the liver or diaphragm. In this case, there is a moderate limitation here, but we also see um, a focal liver lesion. So this is an ultrasound 3 positive visualization uh, B case. Visualization C is where we say there are severe limitations, limitations that significantly lower the sensitivity for detection of focal liver lesions. This is where you think, okay, this ultrasound is worthless. I cannot exclude an HCC in this patient, whether it's because of severe heterogeneity, because of cirrhosis, maybe there's a tumor, I don't know, maybe that's a background liver, or maybe there's such severe beam attenuation or shadowing that you can't see the diaphragm, we all have these cases, or maybe there's so much um, obscuration of the liver, whether it's bowel gas or, or ribs or lung, uh, where you feel like you're not seeing a majority of the liver. These would all be considered visualization C, severe limitations. So in summary, assign an ultrasound category, eight, uh, one, two, or three. These have colors associated with them. This determines management. And an ultrasound visualization score, A, B, or C, grayscale, does not affect management, but informs the expected level of sensitivity of the examination. So I just want to briefly tell you about our experience at Stanford. So we started implementing ultrasound LIRADS at our institution, and we found, uh, when we looked back at our cases, we found that 90% were coded as ultrasound 1, 5% were ultrasound 2, 4% were ultrasound 3, 85% were visualization A, 11% visualization B, and 4% were visualization C. So you might be thinking, okay, well, I'm at Stanford, and everyone in California is skinny, and not that much cirrhosis. <laughs> 
And so it doesn't apply to my institution, but actually Shuchi Rogers at um, Einstein in Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia looked at her numbers. Her numbers are eerily similar to Stanford's, even though she has a very different pa patient population. David Fetzer at UT Southwestern also looked at his numbers. He does have fewer percentage-wise ultrasound ones, more twos and more threes, fewer A's uh, percentage-wise, more B's, but I'm actually surprised that he has fewer percentage-wise C's than Einstein or Stanford. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I also just want to discuss just visualization C. This is probably the most frequently asked question that I have received. Um, and I actually did a little blurb in the SRU newsletter letter about ask the expert on this particular topic, what should you recommend for those cases, patients, with visualization C livers, where you think the ultrasound is just worthless for screening and surveillance? What should you recommend? And the answer is that you cannot blanketly recommend CT and or MR at this time. And the reason for that is that, first of all, it's not, it has not been shown to be cost effective, and there is no evidence to show that that is more effective than ultrasound currently. So that said, a lot of patients do get screening and surveillance with CT and MR. We acknowledge that. But that decision really needs to be made on a case-by-case -case basis between the gastroenterologist, the patient, everyone else taking care of the patient, not a blanket statement at this time. However, as we are able to look at our data and we get performance and outcomes data, then perhaps we might uh, change our recommendations based on our visualization scores. But that'll really depend on what kind of quality and strength of evidence we are able to obtain. OK, so in summary, ultrasound LIRA screening and surveillance. It was just released in August. It's fresh off the press. I hope that you implement it at your institution. There are two scores, the ultrasound category score, one, two, or three. That determines follow-up. And then the visualization score, uh, A, B, or C, that conveys the expected level of sensitivity, but does not determine follow-up.